Hello everyone and welcome back to this part two on optical interactions. So the first video we introduced all the fundamental concept uh, and theoretical foundation for the description of light matter interaction at the nanoscale. We discussed extensively those uh, dipole-dipole interactions radiating dipole uh, framework. Now I would like to focus more on uh, something which is going to be more practical and focus on some physical phenomena. Uh, the first phenomenon I want to focus on is the spontaneous decay. So Purcell, in his paper in 1946, discussed extensively the spontaneous decay rate of the nuclear magnetic moment, a framework where this dipole moment is placed in a cross proximity of the electric circuit. So when this dipole moment is coupled to an electric circuit, it actually can be enhanced with respect to this uh, free space transition rate. So this is basically a breakthrough conceptually because previously it was considered that nuclear magnetic moment transition rate was actually an interesting property of the system. Uh, so Purcell predicted this phenomenon theoretically in 46, but it was actually observed experimentally by Serge Arroche only in 1983. So it took 37 years to actually observe uh, the prediction by Purcell. So two regimes uh, can be actually uh, distinguished in terms of uh, atom field coupling. Uh, the strong regime where the coupling constant kappa is basically larger than the spontaneous decay rate. On the other end, the weak coupling is defined uh, when this coupling constant is much smaller than the actual spontaneous decay rate of the system. Classically, uh, a change in a spontaneous decay rate results from the back action. Uh, so we'll discuss that extensively uh, later on. Uh, basically, the interaction of the atom with its own retarded field. Uh, so what happens is that uh, you have light coming in, interacting with uh, your uh, your atoms, your molecule, your uh, your system. Uh, this system is going to uh, re-emit light via this uh, radiating dipole, and this uh, emission of uh, of light will interact again uh, with uh, the the system. So this is what the, the spontaneous decay. Uh, uh, announcement come from. So uh, I want to emphasize a quick side note before actually going uh, more into the the, the, the physics of this uh, this effect. Uh, discussing briefly about Purcell's uh, original paper in 1946. Uh, so you have the reference here if you're interested in actually looking at uh, the, the paper but uh, basically this paper is uh, just an abstract. So this is the, the whole uh, contribution from, uh, from Purcell from 1946. Uh, this is an abstract to a conference from the American Phys uh, for the uh, Physical uh, Review, American Physical Society. Uh, so uh, this is very short, it's just an abstract. It has never been published in an actual peer uh, review journal, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this uh, contribution, this abstract has been cited over a thousand, a thousand times. Um, so I want to, uh, to highlight a few key points here. Uh, so uh, Purcell discussed originally uh, nuclear uh, magnetic moment transitions uh, at radio frequencies, but this is something which can be general, generalized uh, to a lot of different systems. And uh, he looked at the probability of spontaneous emission, uh, which is basically calculated uh, with this, this expression. So the probability of spontaneous emission uh, per, uh, per inverse uh, second per second uh, is basically uh, given a certain factor uh, here uh, but when this uh, system this uh, emitting system is placed in a, in, a, in a cavity in optical cavity or in this particular case uh, which is coupled to a re resonant electrical circuit this uh, this factor here this amplitude is uh, can basically no longer give the correct number of radiation oscillation per unit volume. Uh, and in fact, this uh, spontaneous emission probability, uh, this, tra this transition rate, uh, in fact, is enhanced uh, when placed in, uh, in an optical cavity or uh, coupled to uh, a resonant circuit. And the enhancement factor is given by this, this quantity here. So this, uh, this enhancement factor, which is now known uh, as the person factor, is proportional to the quality factor uh, of your resonant uh, circuit or optical cavity, the wavelength of optical excitation, and the mode volume uh, of your cavity. So we're going to be discussing this uh, uh, a bit uh, further uh, 
uh, when discussing about quantum emitters, uh, chapter five. Um, but in, uh, for the moment, uh, we focus a little bit on more general aspect of spontaneous decay. Uh, so spontaneous decay per, uh, in itself is a purely quantum effect. Uh, so it would require uh, rigorous treatment using quantum electrodynamics. Uh, so uh, the framework for that is uh, uh, typically fermi golden rule uh, with, that we calculate on this decay rate gamma uh, using uh, the fermi golden rule. Uh, the uh, interaction uh, Hamiltonian uh, in this particular case uh, can be just approximated by a dipole interaction term. Uh, as we discussed, uh, we are dealing with fairly small, uh, fairly small objects, molecules, and quantum dots. So the dipole approximation holds uh, very uh, is very robust and holds very well. Uh, you could eventually include quadrupolar interaction terms, uh, which are very weak in this case. Uh, so in this framework, we can calculate uh, the actual decay rate. So you can expand that. Uh, inject the, the dipole interaction term here, expand this, these terms, and you end up with the expression of the spontaneous decay rate gamma as a function of the square of the in, uh, electric dipole moment P and this quantity, which is uh, the partial local density of states, uh, which is just given by green tensor formalism. So uh, once again, from the classical point of view, uh, if you uh, change the spontaneous decay rate, uh, this change uh, results from the back action. So uh, the back action of the field, uh, once again, is mediated by the green tensor formalism. An important relationship relates the spontaneous decay rate in presence of the cavity respect to the free space uh, decay rate of your molecule. So this is a normalized radiative decay rate uh, of spontaneous emission. This is treated. Uh, this is the quantum, uh, the quantum quantity that you calculate via the uh, fermi golden rule right here, uh, and this is uh, equal actually to the the power of energy dissipation uh, from the dipole radiation. So if you go, come back uh, to the previous video where we discussed the pointing vector of a radiating dipole, uh, so the rate of energy dissipation calculated via pointing theorem is only a classical description of the of the system and you see that this simple relation uh, correlates the quantum description of spontaneous emission with the classical picture of uh, this uh, energy dissipation of a, a dipole uh, radiating. Let's focus a little bit on uh, classical lifetime and decay rates. So if you consider an undriven electric dipole P which is a function of time, this dipole will actually radiate and dissipate its energy and uh, therefore that's going to lead to a total decrease of its dipole moment. So uh, you can see, for instance, on uh, those uh, examples here, so when excited, the dipole will emit uh, some radiations, and over time, uh, the amount of radiation the dipole will actually emit will decay exponentially. Uh, so this is, uh, these are two examples. This is the case for a, a fluorescent molecule, a fluorescent. So once you excite the molecule, it's going to emit light, and then at some point, it's going to just decay and uh, the emission of light of electromagnetic radiation will actually die out. Um, so you can actually describe this in terms of uh, with the question of motion. You have this oscillating dipole, so you have a, an harmonic uh, equation you have to solve. This is the expression, the solution of this equation that gives you uh, this uh, electric dipole radiating light. So you have terms uh, in the, uh, that induce uh, a phase shift of the radiations with respect to the incoming light. So if you have an incoming radiation uh, interacting the molecule, this will basically introduce a, a phase shift for the for the light being re-emitted by the uh, by the uh, the molecule. Uh, and this term here is the the decrease of the oscillator strength. So this is the exponential decay uh, of your of your dipole. Um, so classical expression for the for the atomic rate can also be calculated. So this is the, the atomic decay rate uh, in free space, uh, which is just given by that by this expression. Uh, which is important is this uh, this coefficient here qi, uh, which is the intrinsic quantum yield. Uh, this is a value which is comprised between uh, zero and one. When qi the intrinsic quantum yield is one, that's hundred percent basically of the dissipated power by the by the dipole, which is transferring to radiation. So all the the power being dissipated during this decay here, 100% of this power being lost is actually lost and transferring to free space radiations. 
Um, so for applications, that's exactly what the case you want. So you really want all the energy being dissipated uh, to be transferred into radiations. That means that you're gonna have a very nice emitter. Uh, we discussed about quantum emitters in chapter five. That's the, the adding or scenario you want to be in. Uh, on the other end, when this QI is, is zero, uh, meaning that all the power being dissipated here is lost, uh, for instance, into vibrational motion uh, and non, uh, in general, non-radiative EK channels. So we're gonna discuss that as well in chapter five. So let's focus on dipole-dipole um, -dipole interaction. We've just discussed the interaction between uh, one of these uh, system with the environment. So how this uh, spontaneously decay and emit radiations into, uh, into the environment. We have also to take into account the interaction between two, uh, two systems. So this is the case, for instance, if uh, you, have, you have two molecules or two quantum dots. So each system is a distribution of charges uh, that we discussed uh, extensively in the previous video first part of this chapter, uh, and then we have to look at the actual interaction between those two, uh, those two uh, systems. So we can focus on uh, Coulomb interaction uh, energy, for instance, which can be expressed uh, very simply, uh, dictated by uh, classical electrodynamics as the, uh, the integral of the volume and the product of the, the charges. Uh, so these are the total charges of uh, distribution A and distribution B, so the two, the two systems, the two molecules. Uh, you can actually expand uh, those charge distributions uh, and actually uh, expand this in terms of uh, multiple series uh, when uh, considering that this distribution is fairly small uh, respect to the distance between the two, two systems. So basically you're looking at very small particles, uh, small molecules, and there's, uh, the separation between the two of them is fairly large. So if you expand this uh, Coulomb interaction energy into, uh, into multiples, you, you, you obtain multiple terms. Uh, the first one is uh, translating uh, a charge-charge interaction. So that's the, the classical uh, Coulombic uh, interaction, either uh, attractive or repulsive, depending on the sign of the charges, uh, QA and QB, uh, where those uh, those charges are just basically the integral of the volume of the charge density uh, distribution of each uh, of each system. The second term is a uh, charge dipole interaction. So the charge of one system interacts with the electric dipole moment of the other system. Finally, uh, the third term that we uh, we are interested in is this dipole dipole interaction. So this dipole dipole interaction is actually uh, responsible for uh, van der Waals forces, for instance. So if you have multiple uh, molecules and they are attracted by van der Waals forces, the mechanism it is dipole dipole interaction. Uh, this is also responsible for uh, the, uh, the Forster energy transfer of freight that we're going to be discussing later on. Um, so these are the main uh, the main terms of these uh, multiple series decomposition. Uh, you can of course uh, expand that uh, to, to infinity, uh, including higher order uh, interaction terms like quadrupole charge, quadrupole dipole, and even quadrupole polypole. However, those terms are very weak and do not contribute significantly to uh, to the total energy of the of the system, especially for small uh, small systems like molecules and quantum dots. So energy transfer between particles. Uh, so if you take uh, the example of two uh, two molecules, for instance, uh, each of them uh, uh, can be represented uh, with uh, uh, an electric dipole moment. They are separated by a certain distance. So if you look at this, uh, this system, you can actually calculate uh, quantum mechanically uh, the energy transition rate uh, between uh, the, 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 the first molecule, which is going to be the, the donor, uh, onto the second molecule, which is going to be the acceptor. So you're looking at an energy transfer between the donor to the acceptor. Uh, classically, again, uh, you can actually determine uh, the, power, uh, the power dissipated uh, between the donor and the acceptor using the pointing theorem. So this is once again something that uh, is very similar to what we discussed just uh, just before. Uh, this links the, the quantum description of the rate of energy transfer from donor to acceptor to the, the classical donor's energy uh, per unit time absorbed by the, the donor via the, the pointing theorem. So this, um, this quantity uh, P0 here is the energy dissipated by the donor in absence of the acceptor. So this is the, the total energy 
uh, being dissipated by by this by this donor in absence of the acceptor. So this is exactly what we discussed uh, in the previous video in the first part of this uh, this chapter uh, with the pointing theorem. So when you apply this pointing theorem here uh, in the framework of this dipole approximation, uh, you can actually express and calculate the energy dissipated uh, and transfer from the donor to the to the acceptor. Uh, so you can recognize here the the, the dipole uh, dipole interaction term, uh, where this P A is actually an induced dipole moment uh, on the acceptor uh, when the, the acceptor with a polarizability alpha is actually placed in the electric field. Uh, in uh, generated by the donor. So you have the, the donor here with a certain dipole moment oscillates. This donor generates an electric field all around in space. Uh, if you place the, the acceptor in this field, uh, which is going to be ED, because this acceptor has a certain polarizability, uh, then therefore you're going to induce uh, a dipole moment, an, uh, an electric dipole moment, uh, PA, which in turn will also interact with uh, the electric field uh, in space uh, generated by, by ED uh, and that's going to basically drive the transfer of energy between the donor and the acceptor. So uh, you can actually manipulate this energy transfer uh, between the donor and the acceptor uh, in order to calculate uh, the rate of energy transfer between donor and acceptor. Uh, and you can actually express this as a ratio between this uh, this constant here, which is going to be uh, defined as the Foster radius, and we're going to be discussing that in the next slide uh, over the, the distance. So basically, uh, this tells you that when you bring the two molecules together over a close proximity, then you're going to enhance the energy transfer. Uh, on the other hand, you can also manipulate this, uh, this uh, Foster radius or node in order to enhance this energy transfer. Uh, so let's discuss a little bit uh, the case of uh, Fred uh, between two molecules and let's try to, 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 to understand what this Foster radius or node uh, is, act is actually about. So this R node uh, is the, in the integral over the entire spectrum uh, of frequency of the product of two functions. So this is the, the emission spectrum of the donor times the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. So this integral over the spectrum of this product simply tells you that uh, this R is no more than the spectral overlap uh, between the emission spectrum of the donor and the absorption spectrum of the acceptor. Uh, so let's just uh, look at this simple example uh, of two molecules, fluorescein, and Alexa Fluor 532. So fluorescein is going to be playing the role of, of a donor here. Uh, you can actually measure uh, or calculate uh, the absorption spectrum of this molecule. So this is the, the, the region of uh, the, the spectral, uh, spectral range where this molecule absorbs light and you have the emission spectrum where uh, the light would be emitted uh, by this molecule. Uh, Alexa Fluor, same thing, you have a, an absorption spectrum uh, and you have the emission spectrum of this molecule. Uh, now if you look at the overlap, the spectral overlap between the emission spectrum of this fluorescein and the, uh, the absorption spectrum of this Alexa Fluor 532 and you overlap them, uh, this is what you get. Uh, and when you integrate over the entire spectral range, over the entire spectrum, uh, you're going to basically calculate the spectral overlap here uh, between those two spectra, and that's going to give you the, 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 the Foster radius for this, uh, for this pair of molecules. So the larger this overlap, the, the larger this Foster radius, the larger the transfer of energy between donor and acceptor. So basically what this tells you is that all the, uh, if you, you're basically optimizing uh, how much light can be emitted from one and captured by the other one. So uh, let's focus a little bit on uh, strong coupling. Uh, so the FRET uh, assumes uh, a very small value of the transfer rate of energy, uh, which is smaller than the vibrational relaxation. So basically 
the energy once transferred from the donor to the acceptor never goes back to the donor. So this is a weak coupling regime. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can actually look at the case when dipole-dipole interaction is, is very large, uh, when the energy is very large, and then it's going to give rise to uh, the localized excitation of the donor and the acceptor, and it's going to give rise to, uh, to a coupling uh, we're going to be in a strong regime, so you're going to have a strong regime coupling. Uh, this strong regime coupling can actually be described in the framework of couple of amic oscillators. So if you have two amic oscillators, a donor and acceptor, uh, they are coupled. Uh, and if you solve the system of, uh, of equation, uh, you have the case where there's no coupling. Uh, in this case, the, the energy uh, of one molecule uh, is unaffected by the, uh, by the presence of the other one. Um, and in the case of a coupling, when this kappa is actually uh, different than zero, then there's a, there's a coupling between the two, and then the energy, uh, the resonant energy of one is actually affected by the energy of the one, uh, the other one, uh, and then you have a superposition uh, of two new uh, resonant frequencies. Uh, so we're not necessarily discuss this extensively. Uh, just to, to give you a quick, a quick, uh, quick illustration. So when there's no coupling, uh, if you look at the energy of each individual molecule, uh, you see that the, the two molecules have very similar energies, resonant energies, uh, the absorption and the emission of one. Uh, in that case, for instance, in the case of FRET, the two spectra will be uh, pretty much uh, overlapping. Uh, you see that uh, they have the same energy. Uh, and then when on the other hand, you have a very strong coupling when the kappa is non-negligible. Uh, then when omega A and omega B are actually uh, equal, that's basically where we are here, uh, then you still have two different uh, frequencies that are just a combination, linear combinations, symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, of uh, combinations of omega A and omega B. So this uh, anti-crossing, this uh, this anti-crossing here is a clear signature uh, of strong coupling. This strong coupling uh, regime, uh, as I said, is discussed in the framework of the harmonic oscillators, uh, and this model can be actually implemented to describe a large variety of coupled system uh, that led to, uh, to the discovery of new phenomena like uh, thunder resonances, uh, which can be observed uh, as formation of, uh, of two peaks in an optical spectrum, electromagnetic-induced transparency, uh, which once again uh, tra uh, translates into the, an opening of, uh, of a large deep into the spectrum uh, when there's a strong coupling uh, and other, uh, other phenomena. So to summarize this chapter, uh, we have introduced the concept of multiple expansion and dipole approximation to describe the classical field particle interaction. Uh, we discussed also the radiating energy dipole and I introduced the pointing theorem as a mean to calculate the radiated power and dissipated rate of molecules. And we've introduced the spontaneous decay uh, with the Purcell factor to calculate the decay rate uh, in molecules. Uh, finally, we uh, discussed dipole-dipole uh, uh, interaction uh, framework, uh, which is based on the multiple expansion. Uh, we focused on a special case of uh, Foster energy transfer and a strong coupling uh, regime uh, in the framework of capital harmonic oscillators.